Welcome back to the Authentic Christian Podcast. I'm Aaron. This is Tucker. This is Scott. And today we're going to talk about a video that was responding to one of our videos. Okay. Whew. Um, I think I can probably do this in 15, hopefully. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to. I, I just don't want to come back to it. So uh, let's, let's try to. Spiritually for that. I'm going to say something at the end. I don't mean this um, mean. I know we're over time, but I want to say it. I really think that the devil loves this doctrine. And I don't mean that um, in a mean way to somebody maybe that's watching this. But think about this. Base, if you're the devil and you're the one that introduced sin into the world, yeah, of course God's omniscient. God knew it was going to happen, and God had a plan to save people from it. There's probably a reason that God's going to explain to us one day, and we go, oh, wow, I didn't think of that. Right. Funny, the Scriptures give us those answers in his electing plan. They're laid out for us but we don't want to believe them. The answers have already been given to us. And they direct us to the glory of God in Christ, the triune God, bringing about salvation perfectly, a perfect savior who saves his people perfectly. But the devil loves this doctrine. And that's, uh, I, I understand these men really don't understand what they're talking about, but um, still words I wouldn't want to have to be responsible for. I just, I don't, I don't buy it. The Bible says God's not a respecter of persons, right? Right. And yet Calvinism teaches that. Okay. Now, if you give an analogy, you have to refute the analogy, but God's not a respecter of persons. And yet what they're teaching is that he is. Because see, if you believe in unconditional election, God does not elect based upon what you've done. He is not a respecter of persons. But in your position, he saves you based upon who of you is better. Isn't it better for you to submit to God? Be a, be a, to repent, to be baptized, isn't, isn't that what a better person would do? So he's respecting persons. They, they actually, it's amazing how many people re reverse that and they just heard it so many times, they don't realize, yeah, I'm the one that's saying that God actually saves based upon respecting persons and what they've done because it's in the man. It's not in his, in his sovereign will. We're the ones that are saying, has nothing to do with me. Wasn't anything, I, nothing in me that, would, that drew his... Uh, his grace or mercy. Uh, so it's interesting that they would uh, miss that. So I think in this section, um, he's basically talking about this respecter of persons. And he's saying from Reformed theology, none of you have any opportunity. So everyone's equal. We've all sinned and nobody, nobody is any better. We've all been, I guess, forced to sin through, well, no, we, they'd say we choose to sin because of Adam's sin nature. And they say, if you were in Adam's position, you'd do the same thing. Well, that's kind of weird. We are saying the same. We are saying, if you were in Adam's position, free will, you choose to sin. That's what we're saying. Mm. But we would say, everyone gets the same opportunity. Everyone's equal. That's not a respect of persons. We're saying, look, God said you've all sinned, yet I'm going to give all of you grace, mercy, and grace, and an opportunity of salvation right? That's, that's not being a respecter of persons. But I think when you look at that, let's say that you say, okay, well, look, reform says none of you have opportunity. That's equal. We say everyone gets an opportunity. That's equal. The question then becomes, which is true based off God's word, right? right. What is God centered based off God's word, right? I mean, second Corinthians chapter five, verses 10 and 11, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Does that sound to you like God gives you a choice in the matter and he's going to punish you based off your choices? Or does that sound like God has picked for you? I'm trying to, I don't yeah. know say that. That's not, they don't like that language that God, you all sinned and deserved hell, but God just said, Hey, I'm going to save you anyway. And I'm not going to save you. Does that sound like a respect or persons? Does yeah, it mean a little bit? Yeah. A I little mean, bit. Yeah. I mean, it does. I yeah. mean, I don't, I don't, a lot of it. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, he certainly has some kind of preference. I mean, maybe they would say, well, we don't know how he makes those preferences, but yeah. they would, I mean, he would he, say that he, they he made the know. choice somehow. How did he make the choice? He made nothing the choice. just completely arbitrarily, just completely arbitrarily to glorify him. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they teach. And I just look at passages. What are some other passages for me? Acts 10, 34 and 35. Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted mm -hmm. by him. Yeah. yeah. John 5, 28 through 29, we have, do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I even think of uh, Philippians two twelve. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, 
but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And I point that one out to say, yeah. he's telling, you know, that's telling him, uh, declare like work out your own salvation. Not that yeah. we can, it's not read saying the ne- that. Read the next verse too. Um, just cause people will say, you didn't read the next verse. Oh no, no true. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Yeah. And the question becomes how, how right. does God work with you? Right, right. Right. How does God work in you? I mean, the Bible says, uh, the Bible says in many places that mm-hmm. there's, you have a part and God has a part, right? Yeah. God is not going to, um, throw you away if you're trying to be faithful. Right. Right. So the fact is that you have a part, God has a part, right? You can make, you can say, oh, that's synergism. So what you call it whatever you want. It's what scripture teaches, right? Yeah. I, I'm not going to run from something the Bible teaches. I'm not going to say, oh, they called it synergism. Let's run. I'm not going to run. I didn't know I have a part. No, exactly. So <laughs> I, I don't know. I hope we've, it's been probably four or five hours. I don't know how long it's been since it's been filming, but <laughs> it's been a while. Hopefully we've, we've um, at least presented information that you can go for. We got a couple more, we got 17, 14 minutes of, well, actually no, he doesn't go all one seventeen talking about us. So we're just going to watch a few more minutes and, and look at some analogies and, and then we'll hopefully wrap up pretty soon. If I'm going to make an analogy, let's say you have a parent, all four kids have done the same thing and the parent chains two of them to a pole. The other two are, are, are chained. They're all four chained and they can't come. And he says, come over here and give me a hug or I'll punish you eternally. And all four children say, we, we can't come. We're chained to the pole. And, and the parent goes over and clips two of the chains. Now, two of those people can come get their hug, right? And the other two say, we want to come, but we can't. I mean, Calvinists won't like that analogy, I think, because it, it it's it's emotional, but it, I think it's what scripture backs up. Oh, uh, that's horrific. That is just, that. like I said, um, I didn't think anybody could come up with a worse, more inaccurate analogy than Norman Geisler did, but they just did. Uh, remember Norman Geisler's, I spent a bunch of time on this in Potter's Freedom 20 years ago, well, yeah, tw- over 20 years ago now. Um, his analogy was the swimming hole, remember? Where there's these boys and the farmer tells them, uh, don't go swimming in the swimming hole, it's dangerous, and they go swimming in the swimming hole, and they're drowning out in the middle of the swimming hole, and the farmer comes along, and he only throws a rope to uh, certain of the boys and saves them, but the rest of them he leaves to drown. That was, that was his analogy that he tried to make. Uh, and of course, this is just meant to be hyper-emotional and even worse, but all of it is meant to, to present God in this horrific light and, and, and of course to make light of sin because these are just little kids that did something wrong and come get a hug, hug from daddy or you're gonna be punished eternally. So it's, it's just absurd categories, not even close to being honest or fair. And do you remember what I gave as the counter analogy that if you'd actually let scripture speak and recognize that God has created man in his image, that man suppresses that knowledge, that man exchanges the truth of God for a lie, uh, that man is a rebel against his creator. He takes all of God's goods, gifts and, and, refuses to honor God as a result and seeks to trash God's creation. The, the analogy I gave was of rebels against the king and they have taken over the king's castle and they are ransacking the castle. They are destroying everything in it and they're burning it down on top of themselves. And the son sends, the, the, the son of the king enters into the castle and gives his life to save certain of the, these rebel sinners. He doesn't have to. He would be absolutely just, just nuke the whole place or let the whole thing burn in on top of him. But instead, the son takes on their nature and enters into that burning castle and saves these rebels by changing their hearts. They have hearts of stone, and he changes their hearts of stone into hearts of flesh and changes them from being God haters to God lovers. That's the difference. These people don't believe that men are God haters. They're just, they're just, you know, you just need to give them a little more, more of an argument, you know, and love them a little bit more to Jesus. That's not what the Bible teaches. So in this section, uh, we, he doesn't like the analogy we give. Um, and he, he, I'll say this, let's make this clear. He says, we made light of sin. We've never made light of sin. If you've been watching this thing, we never said sin isn't a big deal. Sin is what put Jesus on the cross. We don't make light of sin. Maybe in our analogy, I should have said evil little kids, right? Cause that's, mm-hmm. we don't think kids are born evil, right? But that's what they would teach. Maybe that's why the analogy is different. 
because they think that children are born evil and guilty of Adam's sin and we don't, right? So anyway, so let's make this clear. We never made light of sin. We never said sin isn't a big deal. We take responsibility for my sin. I don't blame Adam. Mm. It's my fault. I don't blame my sin on Adam. I don't blame it on my sin nature. I did it. I freely chose. I had free will. I was tempted, James 1.14, by my desires, and I sinned. That's what makes the, the gospel beautiful, right? I was rebellious. I'm still rebellious at times. Christ knew it. He died for me on the cross anyway when I was his enemy, Romans 5.8 and 9. And all those other people out there watching, rebellious ones, all of us are. He died for you while you were his enemy too. Mm. You never made light of it. No, never. No. You know, you know in the uh, comparison, <clears throat> when we were preparing for this, I listened to it and I was like, you know, he, he said our example was horrific, but no matter the subject of the method explained, his explanation is the exact same. Four chained children in a room, four rebellions or four rebels in a burning castle. One father goes into the room. One prince goes into the, into the burning castle. Two children are released by the choice of the father and two rebellious hearts are changed by the choice of the prince. And so what we're saying is like, it still goes back to the prince could have, the prince could have, um, change all four of their hearts, just like the father could have um, released all four of them. We're saying like, that's what we're saying. Like you're, yeah. If you want to talk about what's the, fair, the prince could have saved all of them, but he didn't. Fair and all that, and you talk, started talking about what this idea of um um uh, what were we, oh man, I'm I'm at a loss for words. Um, not being a respecter of persons. The idea of not being a respecter of persons would be oh, okay. I'm just going to save everybody then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so I mean, yeah. So I'm saying is like the prince could have went in there. Let's just use his. The prince could have went in there and changed all four of their hearts, or at least said, "Hey, do you want me to change your heart? I, I love you. While this castle's burning down, I love you. I'll change your heart. I'll save you." And what we're saying is, he gives us that option, and we say yes or no. What his saying is is saying the prince went in, saw two of them said, I'm changing you. I'm leaving you two to no, burn. I understand. And I agree. I'm saying like, yeah, his, their view is that only some people are going to be saved, right? Mm -hmm. Only some people are going to be saved. And that's predetermined before the foundation of the world. And God has made that determination and God is no respecter of persons and it has nothing to do with you. Okay. Well, what I'm saying is if God is no respecter of persons and God is going to do what is holy and just, and he's, he's going to save some people. Well, then he's a respecter of persons. If he was not mm -hmm. a respecter of persons, he would just save everyone. He would let mm -hmm. everyone go, which is what you're getting at. Yeah, yeah, he definitely. could have done that. Yeah. He has the power to do that, but he's chose not to do that. Why? I mean, in some sense, you'd have to say that he's a respecter of persons. Whereas what we're saying is God has given the opportunity to everyone and everyone has the choice to make that, to, to take that opportunity for salvation from him. Yeah, right. Jesus, Jesus, or let's say Jesus, the prince, enters into the burning castle. And instead of two people, he gives the opportunity for all of them to be saved. Yeah. Now, right. two of them say, we don't want to be saved. We want to burn. Is that make Jesus, does that make the prince less of a savior? No, it makes oh. the people dumb for does rejecting the salvation. Does that mean that he respected them less because he opened the door for all of them? No. no, of course not. And listen to this. He he talks about giving them a new heart, right? I hear this all the time where they say, God gives you a new heart as if it's something he does miraculously. And he also says, what you want's not fair. This is from Ezekiel, right? Go read Ezekiel chapter 18. Read verses one all the way through verse 32. Listen to Ezekiel 18, one. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge? This is this idea, a proverb that's in Israel, right? Which is that the fathers did something and the children were guilty for it. That's the idea that we're sort of hearing here with this federal headship of Adam, right? Verse four, the soul that sins shall die. Now I'm not going to read the whole chapter. You should go read it. Listen to, I'm just going to skip all the way down to verse 25, right? Yet you say the way of the Lord is not fair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is it not my way which is fair and your ways that are not fair? God is about to give you his way that God says is fair through his prophet. This is God's way that God says is fair. When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and dies in it, it is because of the iniquity which he has done that he dies. His iniquity, not his parents' iniquity. Verse 27, again, when a wicked man turns away from the wickedness he committed, and does what is lawful and right, he preserves himself alive. What? He preserves himself he has alive. A part in he has a part. Mm -hmm. Verse 28, because he considers and turns away from all the transgressions with he committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet the way of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel is not my ways which are fair and your ways that are not fair. Now listen to the instruction he gives them. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways. Now listen to this, mm -hmm. repent, 
and turn from all your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Now listen to verse 31. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die? For why will you die? I have no pleasure in the death of the one who dies. Turn and live. Is that a God that's saying you don't, you can't turn. You can't say the exact opposite. That's God Mm -hmm. saying the exact opposite. That's how you know for a fact that Romans nine, when the objector objects, as God explicitly saying, it's up to you. That's right. You keep saying that it's unjust that the the, the children's teeth are set on edge because of the things of their fathers. Yes. You keep saying that I'm, I'm doing this to you. I'm making everything unfair. But the reality is, look, if you do right, you'll be treated as one who does right. If you yes. do wicked, you'll be treated as one who does wicked. If you want to be saved, then you make yourself a new heart. You make yourself a new spirit and turn and do right. And does that mean man does it all by himself? No. no. It means he does it by the way that God gave him to do it. But God is and saying, fa- I'm going to give you the opportunity. Yes. That's what he's saying. Yes. And yeah. that's how you know that Romans chapter nine, the objector is not an Arminian saying, that's not fair how you made us, God. Mm-hmm. It's not an Arminian. It's a Jew who is rebellious against God for using the Jewish nation to bring the gospel. That's right. Because the objector says, hey, there's unrighteousness with God. Hey, that's not fair. And he says, you don't want fair. God says in Ezekiel 18, this is fair by my book. Yeah. I'm going to give you each an opportunity. And it's up to you. And if you're if you're wicked and you choose to live sinfully, you're going to be punished. That's God's law. And that's God-centered, not man-centered. It's very twisted. Like, you know, his analogy, he makes it seem like, you know, how gracious that the prince saved two, but you know, it's like, what about the other two? You know, yeah. he, he is being a respecter per se. Well, I'll pick you and that's gracious enough. And I'll just let the other two burn. But he said, these people don't, yeah, that's right. He said, these people don't believe that men are God haters. I think do, men do hate God in a sense. They do. I believe people are rebellious. It's their own fault. Not Adam's. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I believe people do yeah. rebel against every single person has rebelled against God. Read Romans three, 10 mm-hmm. and following, but it doesn't say it was from birth right? No. And so we each are responsible for our own, own choices. He sometimes it's like this straw man where he tries to make it out. Like we don't think sin's not that big of a deal and we're not really responsible. And someone else made me do it. It's not what we teach. We teach. I am guilty. It is my fault. I was the wicked one. Mm -hmm. And God sent his son. He became man in the flesh and died on the cross. And that's what John 12 32 means. When I'm lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. How does God draw people? When you look at the story of the cross and you look at you are wicked and you are hell bound and Jesus died on the cross for you. Yeah. Reformed theology makes God responsible for who's saved and who's lost. Yeah, that's exactly what it does. Well, yes, it absolutely does that. I mean, I would, I mean, I would go further than that and say that Reformed theology tries to put on a mask and say, well, yes, you do have the ability to choose and you are condemned for your choices, but too bad you can't make any choices yeah. other than the ones that are going to condemn you. You're guilty. They're your yeah. choices. You're guilty. You made them. And you're responsible, but, but you can't respond. But I'm going to relegate unable. you to a category where the only choices you can ever make are the ones that are going to condemn you. That's exactly right. He said, just make a better argument. Just love them a little more to Jesus. That's no choice at all. And he says, that's not what the Bible teaches. Why did Paul waste all his time arguing in the synagogues, debating with people? Because he thought it was worth teaching people. He thought that the power was in the word. Mm-hmm. He thought that the power was in the word of God. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Verse 21, in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Now they'll say, well, we believe that the word is, no, you just said that you people believe God gives people faith. Faith does not come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You think God gives people faith. And now they'll say, well, we believe that verse and they, you know, but that's not what they believe. Okay, let me say this. They'll say they believe it, and I don't want to say that they're lying. I, I can't judge motives. But when I hear their, the way that they try to reconcile it all, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. No. Um, so, yeah, I think his analogy was pretty similar to us. So I, I have a couple questions I'd like to ask, just people watching. Can God offer blessings to people who obey, obey him and still be sovereign? Does God have the power? Is he allowed to give man a choice? Yes. Of course, if we you believe so, I would ask the Calvinist that so. is, is it okay for you? Does God have the permission that God could offer people blessings to those people who obey and would God still be sovereign? Yeah, why, why can't, why God, can't he? Why can't mm-hmm. God let you? I think so choice. many times people think, well, God's only sovereign if he does it the way I is think God he does. not powerful enough to do what he wants to do regardless of what you choose. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. All right. Is for oh yeah, I won't get into that topic. That'd be another day. Okay, <laughs> that sounds like a big one. We'll I'll get, say okay. it. You should go and ask yourself this. But is foreknowledge equal to foreordained? Yeah, right. just because God knows it's going to happen doesn't mean He causes it. Right? Yeah. He's not this micromanaging God. Right? Does knowing something is going to happen before it happens mean that you cause it to happen? No. 
No. no I don't think anybody knows I mean, that. if I say I'm about to chunk my laptop and you guys know it, like, you didn't prevent, yeah, you ahead. didn't make it happen. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, wait till the out. show's over. <laughs> yeah. Drop it. And then wait, 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 that's it. That's like, I say, hey, I'm about to do this. Yeah. 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 All right. Next clip. And that kind of analogy isn't even close to what the scripture teaches. That's why the one fellow did what, said what he did about Romans chapter 3. Because if you take Romans chapter 3 seriously, then total depravity is obvious. It's clear. And uh, that's why they had to do what they had to do with it. Um, I think he means, he said, if you take Romans 3 seriously, you get total depravity. Maybe he meant Romans 5. If Romans 3.10 is what he's referring to, Romans 3.12 all have turned aside, become unprofitable. Um, I don't think you get it from Romans because I don't have a problem with Romans 3. Uh, I think that the we would still teach that all people have turned aside. All people um, don't seek after God, have become <clears throat> unprofitable. Right. Yeah, but that doesn't mean born unprofitable, right? No. So, yeah, that's, you know. To me, that just means... God, I think he, I God mean, knows everything and he can say that. If, maybe he meant Romans 3, maybe he meant Romans 5. I'm not sure, but either way, I think we've we've looked at both those texts. Oh, I had to get to this. <laughs> All right, Rich, let's see if you're still awake. Let's see if you catch this one. <clears throat> okay, a little test for, for everybody in the audience. That you may be saved. Mm -hmm. Matthew 23, 37, maybe. Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, uh, how long I've wanted to gather you together like a mother hen gathers her chicks. But you were totally, no, he didn't say you're totally, he says you weren't willing. Y'all catch it? Y'all get it? I hope everybody in the audience has been listening to Radio Free Geneva. I forget the first time that I pointed this out. But I even, I even gave an example where R.C. Sproul misquoted it. So this is, that I doubt, one of the most misquoted verses in all the Bible, and certainly synergists who are trying to find some way out of their unbiblical teaching um, this is, this is where they, they do it, but he did it. As soon as I heard him, I started listening and went, ah, there it is again. How many dozens of times now have we documented Dave Hunt and, and George Bryson and all these people. And now these guys misquoting Matthew 23, 37, totally changing the meaning of the verse. It's because their tradition has interpreted the verse for them. They haven't, they haven't actually worked through the text. They've read the text, they have their tradition, and this is, why, this is why traditions are dangerous. Because I'm sure they think Matthew 23, 37 teaches what they think. And if you've read the Potter's Freedom, you know it was one of the, the big three. Matthew 23, 37, 2 Peter, first Peter, second Peter 3, 9, and uh, 1 Timothy 4, uh, uh, 2, uh, was, were the, the big three. That Norm Geiser quoted over and over and over and over and over and over again, and never understood what it was saying does not say you were not willing that God was trying to gather them. God was gathering their children and they, the rulers, were not willing that God would gather someone else, which was their children. This is a judgment oracle. All of Matthew chapter 23 is on the Jewish leaders. So notice he didn't say that. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets, the stones, those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together. Not you, he said you. Gather your children together the way a hen gathers chicks under wings. But you were unwilling, unwilling for God to gather those over whom they had been placed. They were standing in the way of the prophets. And now Jesus speaking to the people of the land. It's a judgment oracle that's going to end up resulting in AD 70. So it's just amazing how often you hear people, they have their traditions and their traditions determine what they see and hear in the text, even what they remember it saying. And it ends up changing the entire meaning because it would have to say how often I wanted to gather you, but you were unwilling. That's not what it says. It's not what it says. You can't turn it into something that it does not actually say so in this section we talk about matthew 23 37 and believe it or not um i don't always quote every passage perfectly from memory Man, you misquoted <gasps> believe, it. What? believe it or, i don't i right. don't so yeah i mean maybe okay i did i'll say that i that i didn't quote it exactly how it is right but let's just read it oh jerusalem jerusalem the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her how often i wanted to gather your children together so jerusalem i wanted to gather your children 
as a hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. All right. So first of all, yeah, it's a judgment oracle. I agree. The whole chapter is talking about the judgment on the Pharisees. I still don't think that the point I was trying to make is wrong, right? Think about this. If the children of Israel were elect, could the Pharisees really thwart God's will? Could they stop God's will? Not if you hold their position. No, because it shouldn't matter because God already ordained the people he wanted to be elect, right? Or you have, well, he's still punishing them. Yeah, for something that they had no chance of turning from. Although we just read all these Old Testament passages where God says, repent and turn and get yourselves a new heart, right? How are they going to be given a new heart? By the thing God tells them to do, right? Repent and turn, right? Mm-hmm. So, okay. If they were unelect, why does it matter? And and then uh, he says, my tradition. Um, let's just let's just say this. Let's say that that was true, right? Did Irenaeus get it from my tradition? Because Irenaeus, an early church writer, uh, you know, hundred years after Christ, right, second century, um, he in against heresies uses this exact same verse to teach free will. All the early guys taught free will. All of them. I mean, like unanimous, right? Um, this is uh, chapter XXX, V 37. Men are possessed of free will and endowed with the faculty of making a choice. It is not true that some are by nature good and others bad. So he says, look, some aren't made different than others, right? This expression of our Lord, this is what he said. How often would I have gathered thy children together and thou wouldest not? Sets forth the ancient law of human liberty because God made man a free agent from the beginning, possessing his own power, even as he does his own soul to obey the behests of God voluntarily and not by compulsion of God, right? He's not inspired, right? But I'm saying, don't let anybody trick you or convince you these early guys, like the early ones after. Like it's always been this way. Like it's always been this way. No, it hasn't. Reformed it hasn't. theology is not, is not the original system. That no. The common man held. I had an argument with a guy once and we were- uh, Or even the scholar held. No, yeah. no, exactly right. We'll get to that in a minute. I was having a discussion with a guy that came to hear me preach once. He's a reform guy. He wouldn't come hear my sermon. He just met me back at the building after lunch. We talked for like a really long time. And um, he basically said, you know what? Your teaching's heretical. I said, according to who? He said, what do you mean? I said, yeah, if I was in the 1500s in Europe in the Reformation, what I'm teaching is heretical. But if I'm amongst the early church writers, what I'm teaching is exactly what they taught. Well, your teaching is heretical, right? Mm -hmm. And I basically said, look, so many times people that say, oh, that's heretical. They look back to, they don't look back to scripture, right? They'll look Mm -hmm. back to, well, this council, well, that that guy was deemed a heretic. The reformation. Yeah. The reformation, you know, or Or whatever you want to say to Augustine. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, whatever you want to go back to, but let's say you don't like Matthew 23, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say, Hey, that's not what he was. Jesus was saying in Matthew 23, 37. He was saying, you weren't willing that I gather your children. We already mentioned this passage. Tell me this doesn't have the same application. John 5, 34. I say these things that you may be saved, right? John 5 40, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Jesus is literally giving witnesses, trying to convince them of who he is. And he says in verse 40, you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. Mm-hmm. Is Jesus dangling this out in front of a person that's not able to respond? No. Oh, ye of little faith, but he knows it's his fault. He's the one that won't grant it. Mm. It's just not consistent. Mm-mm. It's just not consistent. No. All right. Getting close to the end. If you survive this long, we're very, we're very <laughs> impressed, you know? Well, I don't know many people that would listen to us talk this long. <laughs> um, there was a quick ducking of John chapter six. It, w- it wasn't long enough. He, he, he did the John 12, 32. Uh, let's, let's jump out of John six, grab this over here, bring it back. Pure eisegesis. Again, all tradition would fall apart in any meaningful debate. Many, he said it'd fall apart in a debate. I mean, my tradition, John Chrysostom is who I quoted earlier on John six forty four, And he said, guess what? You know who uses that John 6, and says we don't have a choice is the Manichaean Gnostics, right? So I'm just saying we did deal with that passage a little bit. So, and if you know what, we have that article in the link tree podcast resource page um, from Christian Courier called the drawing power of God. And so it goes through, it explains John 6, 37, uh, talks about the verb tenses and all this other stuff. So if you want to read that, that's in the link tree uh, podcast link tree resource. Uh, Cause you can't make a connection between you two and you're missing the context of both sec- both texts and uh, dealt with that many, many, many times before. Uh, let me just um, get to one other, just one other quick thing here, because uh, I um, this one right here is I find this will connect us into something else we've talked about. So, one last one. Like multiple times in the last couple of weeks, but what I'm saying is like I care about your soul. I think you're caught up in something that's false that didn't exist for 1500 years till John Calvin came along and wrote Institutes. And you can get some things you see from Augustine, but I just think that you're following something that's not biblical and not man-made. Uh, he, he meant to say something that's man-made. Um, so he said uh, it didn't exist uh, until Calvin wrote the Institutes. Uh, and he got some stuff from Augustine. Right. 
Um, I suppose if he had offered, uh, you know, an actually meaningful exegetical interpretation of Romans 8 and 9 and John 6 and John 10 and John 17 and Ephesians 1 and so many other texts that at least you would be able to give it some thought. But uh, let's, let, let's think. Uh, Augustine's writing his anti-Pelagian works in the first portion of the fifth century. 410 onward, 20 to his death. Clement, and we don't know that was his name, but the church at Rome sent an epistle to the church at Corinth somewhere either at the end of the first century or the very beginning of the second. Could be as early as before AD 70 or as late as 110, 120. So you're talking uh, a, a solid three centuries before Augustine, right? And if you have read much of this epistle, then you know that one of the epistle's favorite words is the word, the elect, the elect. Let me read just one portion of this. Now we've gone over these in uh, March, April of 2020. We went through a, a fair amount of Clement at that point to demonstrate his uh, soteriology. Day and night, you were anxious for the whole brotherhood that the number of God's elect might be saved with mercy and a good conscience. The number of God's elect might be saved with mercy and a good conscience. I like pointing out these little facts uh, because folks get real accustomed to just throwing stuff out without actually doing much reading in the original sources. And so it becomes fairly easy. When you, when you literally say that Calvin made all this stuff up, you're just demonstrating you don't know anything about church history at all. You have done no first level reading, zero, none. It's embarrassing, but there you go. But there you go. Oh, in this one, um, he's talking about church history and he's talking about the comment that I made that said that it didn't exist uh, until Calvin, but you got some things from Augustine. Um, I probably would love to rephrase that and say that it didn't exist till Augustine. Uh, but I guess we're talking, I was in the, in the context, I'm caught up talking about Calvin and say it didn't exist till Calvin. Um, most of what Calvin got, I guess you could say that's true because most of what Calvin got was from Augustine. So you've read um, some of Augustine, some of the early church writers and things, haven't you? Yeah. I think, I think we've talked about that a lot here at the office. Uh, well, I mean, when I'm familiar yeah. with some of it. When, yeah. When I first got here, I, I'd never really thought about even ever checking early writers. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we sit around and talk about it a lot and you've brought up different articles and point back to this just to, to prove now these guys aren't inspired, but it's cool sure. to be able to look back in history. And I wouldn't have known that if you wouldn't have shown me that. Cause I know you read this stuff all the time. Well, I just, I know it's one of your hobbies, right? So, yeah. Um, so I don't, I feel kind of awkward talking about it, but I guess it's been, I don't know. I'll just bring it up. Like, Sometimes people like to, what they do in their spare time, they watch college football and like, I like to read the apostolic fathers. Yeah, you and come and the, get you the next morning. I mean, like what did I, I gave Tucker read. a 30 page document on all the apostolic and yeah, anti- I was just reading anti, just martyr last night and whatever. <laughs> anti -Nicene, you know, all the anti-Nicene before yeah. the Nicene Creed, all those fathers and the post-apostolic fathers. And I mean, like I gave Tucker a 30 page document on what all of them said about baptism, like, like quotes, you know? So it's, mm -hmm. I mean- so I have done the reading, but I'm going to say this. If you're watching, yeah. even if you know me well, I, you, I, we're going to say like, I'm not a scholar, right? Yeah. But I'll say this, this idea, first of all, this idea that um, that quote from first Clement teaches what he teaches, I think that's pretty weak. I mean, I'm not trying to, I'm trying to be as respectful as possible, right? Um, Cause it's easy to get worked up in these, but you know, he, he brought up that quote from first Clement and he, he, this is the quote. It said day and night, you were anxious for the whole brotherhood that the number of God's elect might be saved with mercy and a good conscience. I don't think that's a very good support passage. I mean, God is God omniscient. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yes. he knows the number of who'll be saved, right? Yes. Um, first Peter one, two scripture says elect according to what the foreknowledge of the father. 
God looks into the future Anthrop- hypothetically, he's outside of time, right? From our perspective, yeah, he knows the it's, future. It's a how expression. Do, it's a pre- exactly. Yeah. It's an, an expression, right? So God knows the beginning from the end. That doesn't mean that he forces people. It's it's kind of like they see the word elect or predestined and think that their definition of it is the only one that is right. Therefore, they right. see the word predestined or elect, which is in scripture, and think, "Hey, this is this guy's obviously reformed." Mm-hmm. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try. Uh, let's just talk about this. All right. Um, there is a, a Baptist guy named Leighton Flowers. Okay. Um, he has an interview on YouTube with a guy named Dr. Ken Wilson, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not a scholar, right? Dr. Ken Wilson has his PhD from Oxford. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oxford in England, which is like one of the most world renowned. He qualifies um, as a scholar. It, he qualifies as a scholar. Right. And so he's one of the world's most like foremost Augustinian scholars, right? Like, I think, um, I heard him say there's, that there's one guy that like publishes, like, I don't know, he's a, he's a academic and there's like only six or seven people in the world who've ever read Augustine's work that they know of chronologically, from, chronologically from beginning to end. Right. And so he literally wrote his PhD thesis on the doctrines of Augustine. And he looks at the, the, the Augustine's like transformation, right? Mm-hmm. Because Augustine was a Gnostic for 10 years, a Manichaean Gnostic. And then he became a Christian and he argued free will, like the same thing we're trying to teach. He argued people have free will. They can respond against the Manichaeans, against the Manichaeans Mm -hmm. and other Gnostics. I think I I haven't read, I'll be on, I haven't read all of it. Right. But I can listen to what a world round scholar says and say, Hey, this guy probably knows what he's talking about. He has his PhD from Oxford. And he talked about his, his PhD dissertation was um, reviewed by three of the world's like renowned uh, people that know that field, historical scholars, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not like the guy just wrote something like a PDF ebook and gave it out, right? right. So he goes to Oxford. He spends a year, according to him, you know, reading everything, right? And Manichaean Gnosticism is what um, Augustine was for 10 years. Becomes a Christian, argues for free will until 412 when he starts arguing with... Uh, Pelag- Pelagius. Pelagius, Pelagius yes. right? Pel- you know, you're a Pelagian, right? Mm-hmm. And they were arguing about infant baptism. And he basically realized that... Um, I'm not going to get the story right, but it was this idea of, you know, two babies. They're both about to die. They're rushed. One gets baptized as the Catholic church taught uh, baptismal regeneration, which Augustine, I believe is the first one to come up with that too. And one didn't make it. And so he said, it has to be God's foreordained decree. And that's what led him back into the idea that the Gnostics had of predestination, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They, they were at that point, there was this idea of baptismal regeneration that had come up. And so mm-hmm. you need to baptize the child to get rid of this, this sin that's attached to it because mm-hmm. the child, if it dies without baptism, it'll, it'll go to hell. So everyone would take the children and there was infant mm-hmm. baptism going on all the time. So it came about, I remember this story. It came about from them arguing that particular point. Mm-hmm. What, what happens to the one child who's born to, I think it was two, Christian, Christian parents. parents and the other one was like a prostitute and they're on the way, but their child, they don't make it there. Something happens and the child dies before they make it. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. then the one that has a child as a prostitute makes it. Okay. Well, how do you, how do you deal with this idea of, of, of children and infant baptism and regeneration? Well, anyway, well, no, just to ahead. add to this, I'm not trying to cut no, you off. No, you, you take it. From there me. were writers before, right? So we believe it or not, you, you might agree with us on Calvinism and think we're wrong on this. We do not believe that man inherits sin of Adam. We think Ezekiel 1820, the son will not inherit the guilt of the father, right? right? Mm-hmm. Romans seven, nine, Paul was alive apart from the law. Right. He reached an age of accountability that the commandment came, sin revived and he died. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's what we believe. But there were some early writers that thought that there were some effects inherited from Adam, but they thought it was like a proclivity to sin. Um, like you were more, um, I guess, yeah, you were bent towards sin, right? This sort of sinful nature. But it seems like Augustine was the first person that said that inherited sin from Adam would condemn a baby to hell, right. which is why they started baptismal regeneration. Why did they start baptizing babies? Because in the New Testament, when you wanted your sins forgiven, you were, a, you were baptized as a penitent believer to have your sins forgiven by the blood of Christ. Every, all the early writers are also unanimous about that, right? Go read yeah. Everett Ferguson and some of these other guys. Yeah. Or I can give you 30 pages of, of quotes, <laughs> hey, <that's> right? <laughs> um, but so you had that. And so that's when this idea started, this argument with Pelagius, right? Mm-hmm. And in the process of him arguing with Pelagius, what does he do? He changes, he his, changes his view. His he changes his position. Yeah, he he goes back to what he, what he, he, he leaves from being arguing for free will, which he had argued and debated before with the Manichaeans. Yep. To now saying, no, no, um, Instead, he had a quote. What was the quote? Who? 
uh, Augustus. He changed his when oh, he changed it was, position. It was, I, he said something I about remember. I argued uh, for free will, but the grace of God won out. Yeah, or something yeah, like yeah. That. So he he admits that he changed his position yeah. later on. Yeah, and his position when he flip flopped, where as when he was free will and arguing against the Manichaeans, he changed that position to win his debate with Pelagius, and he went over to no determinism, yep. which was what he held prior to becoming a Christian when he was one of the Manichaeans. It is a it is a Gnostic doctrine, their idea of you can't do anything. Yeah, and uh, let's be clear. Like we're saying, we're not calling reform theology. We're not calling you Gnostics. We're not saying that you believe in the dual, the dualism, the two gods, the good God, the evil God, the demiurge, all this other mm -hmm. stuff that Irenaeus writes about that I've read right. um, in against heresies. We're not saying that. We're saying that one thing the Gnostics did teach, one aspect at least, is that God had determined all things you can trace it back to Stoicism, which maybe led to the Essenes, which maybe influenced Gnosticism, right? I'm not a scholar. Other people are. You can go read the scholars. Mm -hmm. But what you see is the things, some of the things the Gnostics taught was that since all flesh, all physical things are evil, yeah. that when a baby is born, that baby is evil, right? Therefore, the good God of Gnosticism, mm -hmm. right? This is Gnosticism, not Reformed theology. Gnosticism, the good God has to infuse faith. It has to regenerate and wake up the good in that evil physical creation. Mm -hmm. And so you can look and see how these things never existed in early writers until Augustine. And this quote that he brings up for first Clement is not a good quote. In fact, you know, you'd say, okay, well, if you find somebody that is, um, that's a, uh, that agrees with us on free will, mm -hmm. you'd say that's probably biased, right? Yeah. You can look up a lot of reformed Calvinistic writers. I got screenshots on my phone. We watched some material from, um, from this guy, Ken uh, Wilson, there's just phenomenal material. I mean, yeah. yeah it was, if you want to learn well just, it. I mean, I'm sure that if I sat down with Ken Wilson, we'd disagree about a lot of things with regards to salvation. Um, but I'm saying this, there are some things that he brought up historically that are incredibly accurate. And um, you guys want to hop in? Cause I'm trying to go back through all these screenshots that I took. Okay. I found one. This is from, <laughs> you want to hop back in? Nope. Sorry. You missed your chance. This is from, this is reformed. <laughs> the reformed doctrine of predestination by Lorraine B O E T T N E R. Never met the guy. Don't know how to pronounce his name. So hopefully that doesn't um, mean too big of a deal of what he said. The earlier church fathers placed emphasis, chief emphasis on good works, such as faith, repentance, almsgiving, prayers, submission to baptism, et cetera, as the basis of salvation. They, of course, taught that salvation was through Christ, yet they assumed that man had the full power to accept or reject the gospel. Um, the early church leaders taught a kind of synergism in which there was a cooperation between grace and free will. This is a Calvinistic reformed guy writing that book, right? We didn't write it. He says, this cardinal truth of Christianity or Calvinistic soteriology, soteriology means the doctrine of salvation, was first clearly seen by Augustine, the great spirit-filled theologian of the West. In his doctrines of sin and grace, he went far beyond the earlier theologians. He taught an unconditional election of grace and restricted the purposes of redemption to the definite circle of the elect. This is a quote from John Calvin. John Calvin said this, all theologians with the exception of Augustine are so confused, vacillating and contradictory on this subject that no certainty can be obtained from their writings. Calvin admitted, it may perhaps seem I have greatly prejudiced my own view by confessing that all of the ecclesiastical writers, with the exception of Augustine, have spoken too ambiguously or inconsistently on this subject, that no certainty is attainable from their writings. He basically says, let's translate it. This uh, Calvin is writing, he's looking back and saying, hey, of all those writers for the first 400 years, they all got it wrong, except for Augustine. It's funny that that's the kind of thing he says, because if you go read, go read John Calvin's commentary on John 3, 3 through 5, and he makes this statement. He says something to the effect, I'm from memory, I don't remember. So, um, he, but he says that all the expositors um, from Chrysostom to the present day have mm -hmm. made this being born again of water refer to baptism. But Calvin says, but I cannot believe that God would affirm this to the sign. It would be inappropriate. So he basically says, hey, everybody before me has said that this is baptism, but it can't be because I think it's inappropriate. So that's two instances that he says, everybody was wrong before Augustine. Does that not make you nervous that a guy says, hey, everybody for the first 400 years, they were the early writers that came after, some of them even studied under the apostles like Ignatius, right? That I've read his stuff. They were all wrong. Well, I mean, we got 
<clears throat> that make you, that should make you nervous. Yeah. Yeah. Or baptism. Hey, yeah. everybody was wrong up until the 1500s. That should make you nervous. Well, here, yeah. here's two quotes from Ignatius in AD 30. He lived from AD 30 to 107. But okay. if anyone is truly religious, he is a man of God. But if he is irreligious, he is a man of the devil made such not by nature, but by his own choice. And then the second one by Ignatius. And there is sent before us life upon our observance of God's precepts, but death as the result of disobedience and everyone according to the choice he makes shall go to his own place. Let us flee from death and make choice of life. Hmm. I mean, you know, the, the Ken, um, Wilson, he, his, his PhD dissertation was on this and he, uh, he also wrote a shorter book for historical purposes that I think is great. If you're trying to look into what the early writers said about this stuff. And, um, I mean, you, you know, somebody will say, well, I've never read a wink of Augustine. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I'm not Augustinian. Well, if you read Calvin or if you've studied under somebody who gets their stuff from Calvin and institutes, right? Like nobody reads Romans nine and gets that idea in my estimation without having some sort of guidance in that way. Nobody goes to John five forty. You were not willing to come to me that you may have life and says, oh, that's not really what it means. Unless you've had some, some coaching, some help, you know? And I think what you're trying to say is that, you know, it, there is historical proof mm-hmm. of early writers from um, 400 below of yeah. it talking about free will. All of them. They all agree. Yeah. Unanimous. Yeah. And, and that's why I think the quote that he gives is a weak quote. Mm-hmm. It just uses the word elect. God has foreknowledge. We, we agree that God knows the beginning to the end. He knows it all. And that was Clement, So if right? he knows, uh, yeah, Clement, yeah, Clement of Rome writing to Corinthians, maybe in first Clement. Well, once you finish, I got I got one quote from him. Yeah. Okay. All right. Go ahead and read it. Well, this is Clement, same dude. He was trying to, that free will was given because he who is good by his own choice is really good. But he who has made good by another under necessity, is not really good because he is not what he is by his own choice. What would you, does it say what Clement that's from? Is it from first Clement, second Clement, third? It says anti Nicene father. Yeah. That means before the Nicene council. Okay. Mm -hmm. Volume eight published BRC. Okay. Um, the, the, you know, sometimes people say, well, I don't know if that right. I'm not saying that is. I'm saying sure. some people say, well, yeah, I'm not sure. sure if that either way it's sure. unanimous. And if you want to read those, we can't do the research. I can't do the homework for you. Right. Like I can't, right. I wish I could just go wah and give people the things sometimes that I've studied. Right. Right. But I could probably could have picked a better sound effect than wah. That's pretty good. Know, That's like, a good one. Like we should record that. Pull that, that one out. Add it to the, the board. soundboard. Stuff, but no, what we're so. saying is you, you can go read the stuff for yourself. Right. Like, you know, you may not want to read all of the early church. You may not get as much enjoyment as I do out of reading. Sometimes I, my wife was joking me last night. I was like telling my wife about, I was like, you got to listen to what I was reading and blah, blah, blah. And she's like three minutes. <laughs> she's like, give three minutes to tell me what you want to tell me. I'm like, ah, oh, is that when that. you texted, he texted us last night, two videos. He's like, this is an hour long one or two hour long. I'm like, you need to watch this. You need to watch this. Cause yeah. it's like, this that is really great. This though. isn't stuff. A lot of the stuff I've, we've studied before. I've studied before. Right, so it's like, right. I know this is a great video. I want you to watch it. So anyway, but um, then, so I would say this, um, what we're saying is we're not saying that all reformed theologians are Gnostics. I'm not saying you don't believe in right. God of the Bible. All I'm saying is that Augustine was the first person to introduce this sort of idea in the early church. Right. Nobody before him, you can't find, you can't find writings. Right. And so I've heard some, I've even watched some videos where James White tries to bring some out. And I think that the couple that he used are out of context. Mm-hmm. And there's even a video of Ken Wilson responding to that video and showing the context, right? Cause Ken Wilson fluent in Greek and James White is, and I'm not, and I don't claim yeah. to be right. right. Um, so I'll let the scholars battle that one out. Um, but that's the idea is you can go watch more information. We maybe, maybe we'll put a link on the link tree. Yeah. I'm not sure I want to um, yeah. get approval of that first, but uh, if not, you can reach out to us and we can just show you the video, but so it's for historical purposes, right. the guys that made it, we're probably going to disagree with them on other doctrinal, yeah, doctrinal things. Definitely. Yeah. So, but this is just for the sake of the history of right. Aug- Augustinian, you know, uh, Augustine and Augustinian theology and how it influenced Calvinism. So right. um, he also said this, he suppo- said that he supposed if we offered meaning exegetical interpretations, and he said like of six chapters, um, that's not possible. And he said many others. So in, in an hour, um, that that would maybe make him consider it. He didn't do that in his video. We can't do it in ours. Mm-hmm. That wasn't the, the purpose of ours. Um, we do believe you can use a verse with, uh, if you, I mean, I, we, there's lots of times I know the context of Acts 2. Every time I bring up that verse, do I have to walk you through it? No, I like teaching exegetically. I'm teaching through Daniel right now at South Haven and we're starting on chapter 10. We right. went, we're going verse by verse through yeah. that book, right? I like teaching that way. But when I look at, at Hebrews, the Hebrew writer, or I think I must, I think I said Paul earlier, but yeah. the Hebrew writer, whoever he was, right? We don't know <laughs> whoever the Hebrew writer was. 
he many times grabs a text from here and exegetes it. Now he's got inspiration of the Holy spirit, right? Guess what? I don't have that. Right. Yeah. But at the same time, I think you're easily able to pull different passages. He's done that. He pulled Romans eight. He pulled Romans eight, five through eight, whichever passage he pulled out. I mean, he didn't give a meaningful exegetical approach of Romans eight and he probably did somewhere else. We can do that too, you know? Mm-hmm. So, but, um, anyway, yeah. Um, the quote from Clement of Rome, I think was, was a weak quote. Maybe he has better quotes. Um, I haven't seen them. Um, so yeah, um, I'm trying to look through to see if there's anything else that he mentioned. I think that's probably pretty good. I mean, I have lots of other, you know, quotes in here from first Clement, right? I've read the whole letter of first Clement, um, chapter 46, it's, it's a long one. It says we're better for him that he had never been born than that. He should cast a stumbling block before one of my elect, right? So it's talking about the elect, right? But is it the Calvinistic type? Yea, it were better for him that a millstone should be hung about his neck. Why? That he should be sunk into the depths of the sea. This is somebody who caused an elect one to save a person to yeah. stumble. It says this, uh, that he should cast a stumbling block before one of my little ones. Your schism has subverted the faith of many. What does that mean? Subverted the faith of many. Hmm. You've caused them to stumble. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. You've caused them to stumble, maybe to fall, to stumble, to fall. Undermined. Undermined it. Yeah. You've discouraged many. It's given rise into doubt in many and caused grief to us all. And still your sedition continues. I don't think that, I mean, would the, would the elect need their, would the, would the non-elect need their faith subverted? No, they can't yeah. respond. Right. Mm-hmm. They aren't regenerate, but this says the text, the elect can have their faith subverted. Um, I have so many that I probably shouldn't read for time's sake. Go read Justin Martyr, his dialogues, chapter 141. That's mm-hmm. one from my notes that I wrote down. Uh, go read Irenaeus against Her- heresies, chapter 37. Um, I'm trying to look through my notes. I don't want to read all these. I'll read. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't read all these. Um, yeah, I'll let you do the reading. Go get Ken Wilson's uh, his, is a book on the history of Augustinian theology. I think he even wrote a shorter one that summarizes his dissertation. Um, the point is to prove though, what that yeah. free will, the idea of choice that was unanimous synergism yes. or whatever was yeah. unanimously, unanimously taught for the first 400 years. And that guy that I read Botner, Botner, Butner, I don't know how to pronounce it. He's a reformed, uh, Calvinistic theologian historian. And he said, he, he's the one that said that I didn't, it's not like I'm getting that from my own resources. Yeah. He said, that it didn't exist until Augustine. Yeah. And so he's a scholar. I'm not. Uh, Ken Wilson's a scholar. I'm not. He's got his PhD from Oxford. It's not like it's some unknown university that mm-hmm. he didn't have world experts. And then he had another three world experts in that same topic that had to look over his, um, his manuscript before it publishes a book. So it's not like these guys haven't been vetted as far as the original sources, you know? Right. right. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to, I could read some stuff from Chris Austin, but I'm not going to. So uh, let's go ahead. I think we're probably at a point where we can, I think we're getting close to the end of the video. And um, do you guys have anything else we need to say about that? I'll summarize. Augustine was a Manichaean Gnostic for 10 years. He then became a Christian. He argued for free will until about 412 when he was debating with Pelagius and he changed his position to win the debate. He went back to these ideas that the only place they existed at that time in history, they weren't anywhere in the Christian church. They were right. only in Gnosticism. Yeah. So where did he get it from? He had to get it from Gnosticism. He got it from and his past. In fact, the, the same verses that the, the Manichaean Gnostics used to argue for men not having free choice to do good or evil. All right, notice I said free choice to do good or evil. Um, they're the same verses Calvinists use today. Romans 8 and 9, Ephesians 1. John six forty four, which I read Chrysostom's response where he said, Chrysostom said, this is a verse that Gnostics, that Manichaeans go to. Uh, I don't need, you want me to read it again? I'll read it again. Yeah, why not? Uh, let's see, let's find it in my notes. Here it is. John six forty four. no one can come to me unless the father which has sent me draws him. That's one of the arguments that he made in his video today. The Manichaeans spring upon these words saying that nothing lies in our own power. Yet the expression shows we are masters of our will. And then he basically says, the words do not take away our free will. They show that we greatly need assistance. The grace of God has appeared to all men, bringing salvation. Titus mm-hmm. two eleven. how? Verse 12, instructing us. We need help. I can't do it myself. Mm-hmm. In fact, I believe I read somewhere, I'm not a Pelagian, uh, Pelagius expert, but that he thought that we could earn salvation. We don't believe that. No. Right? So if no. he didn't believe that, then right. he didn't believe it. And don't trust me because I wasn't there. And I don't want to attribute something to the guy that he didn't believe. But I'm just saying, it seems to be from reformed and non-reformed church historians that Augustine is the first one to bring in the guilt of original sin, which is where infant baptism came for the remission of sins, baptismal regeneration, Mm -hmm. Catholic church teaches way different than what we teach. And it also seems like he was the first one to introduce this determinism into the early church. It's non-existent before that. 
So, um, all right, that's it. I guess a summary. So this kind of, uh, this kind of rhetoric amongst the church of Christ folks is just constant. Uh, these guys are on the top level of that. They really are. I've, I've heard significantly less controlled. I appreciated the fact that they weren't, let's just say I've heard some church of Christ guys that if these guys are using a hammer and tong, they would use a flamethrower. Okay. So, uh, so I did appreciate that. And if, if they'd like to do something like, um, John six or Ephesians one, uh, something along those lines, uh, straight up debate equal time based on the original languages. Great. I think, I think, I think they, I get the feeling these guys, and I'm saying this is a compliment. These guys would be, we could work with them and they would, um, stick with the time frames, and you'd have a, you'd have a meaningful exchange. Uh, despite how strongly I've had to deal with a lot of just basic errors and misrepresentations and just factual stuff. Uh, I think they could do that. There's a lot of other people I've encountered. Mm, no, that would never happen. Uh, you'd be, and one of the problems I think today with doing things electronically is that you have to have some level of trust that the other side isn't going to really wildly misbehave because if you're not in the same room together, there's not quite as much control, I think, as, as you might have in other situations. So anyways, okay, I skipped over a few that I had in the thing there, but got to most of them, uh, even though I was talking fast and even made them talk fast, <laughs> just a little bit. So appreciate your listening to the Radio Free Geneva today. My plan uh, is to have a regular program uh, tomorrow uh, because there are developments taking place uh, all the time in our world and we need to talk about them, be prepared for them. So uh, we're going to try to get back to And besides that, uh, next week uh, we start traveling again. And so you've got that kind of thing. So anyways, thanks for listening to the program today. We'll see you next time. So um, that's the last clip kind of wrapping up the video. Um, I'll say this. I appreciate the kind words that he said about the way he presented yeah. it. Um, we absolutely don't want to come across as anything else than respectful. Right. And uh, I think he was respectful in his. Um, I, I didn't really think there was anything he said that was inappropriate. I mean, I know that we both disagree strongly, right? Um, and he disagrees with us. And um, so I, I, uh, I appreciate him defending what he thinks is the truth. And that's what we're trying to do. And um, as far as the debate in the original languages, I don't know the original languages that yeah. well, right? I've been, yeah. I've been learning and sure. um, I've been building my vocabulary and I've read some grammar and watching some Bill Mount stuff. And so, but yeah. um, I came out of the corporate world about three and a half years ago. So I don't claim to be the most knowledgeable. When I reference Greek, I try to reference uh, scholars. So I don't think I'm anywhere near his, uh, his ability in the original languages, but, but I'm working on it. Yeah. So we'll see. We we'll see be, what happens. We won't be reading from our Greek New Testaments. No, no, no. <laughs> but, you know, Not unless I got the inner linear on here, you know. There you go. Yeah. Even that, man. I'd from mispronounce the words. But. Do a rough translation. We're, we're, we're working on it. that in school. No, yeah. it doesn't sound anything like once you smooth it out, buddy. Yeah. But hey, I'd say we appreciate his compliment. I mean, we, sure. like, that's... We're thankful that you did this video. It's, it's really cool to see how social yeah. media works. And yeah. we can all of us always just check the scriptures. Yeah. Like, so thank you so much for your compliment. Like, you know, yeah. uh, it's an honor to be able to just, you do a video of that. And so we can just all go back and look at scripture. Well, and we think what Paul said in Acts 17, 11, um, that basically talks about the Bereans, how they were more, no, more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily yeah. to find out things, which, which things were so, and they were checking out the apostle Paul. Who had he, the was Holy in, Spirit. he was inspired. Yeah. Right. And they still checked out the scriptures. So we appreciate him doing the response. Uh, we think, you know, basically all we can do is present our sides and then yeah. let you, you know, be the judge. And um, who knows if a discussion will between us will, you know, yeah. a live one will, will happen or not. So we'll have to see. But those for those of you who made it to the end, well done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Revelation 2.10, be thou faithful unto death. And you probably got pretty close watching <laughs> oh, this. No idea how but, long um, this is going to be. <laughs> but yeah, we appreciate you watching. And um, if you need any resources or have questions about anything we brought up, reach out to us. Check out the podcast resource page. We'll have as many resources as we mentioned in the podcast. After this is edited, we'll watch through it and say, oh, we need to put that resource there. And uh, if we forget, happen to, to forget one or we mentioned something in passing you want, just let us know. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you back next season on season three of the Authentic Christian Podcast. Have a good day.
Hey guys, thanks for listening to the Authentic Christian Podcast. This podcast has been sponsored by GBN, Gospel Broadcasting Network. You can download the app and start streaming every show, watch every episode, and discover the answers to life's biggest questions today.